So contrary to what Dr. Ficker said earlier, we try not to torture people with our testing, but it, is, it does get extensive sometimes. So I'm here to talk to you about memory. And um, let's start out this way. Raise your hand if you think your memory is not quite what it should be. Now I want you to look around the room, OK? <laughs> Pretty much everybody. People with epilepsy, people without epilepsy, none of us like how our memory is, is doing, right? And I'm going to come back to that point. I would put myself in that category too, by the way. All right, so let me explain what we're going to be talking about. Um, memory is evaluated clinically by a clinical neuropsychologist, which is what I am. Most people have never heard of clinical psychology, so I'm going to start out by telling you what that is. Um, then we use the word memory like it's one thing. But memory is actually a lot of different things, and so I want to talk about that a little bit. I feel like I'm echoing and I'm being too loud. Okay. Um, we'll talk about what it is about epilepsy that can make people vulnerable, yeah, vulnerable to memory problems. And then I have some approaches to talk to you about that really can help anyone in situations that are memory intensive, whether you have epilepsy or not. OK. So epilepsy obviously starts in the brain. And because of that, people who have epilepsy also are vulnerable to having other cognitive problems. And just to put us all on the same page, when I say cognition, I'm referring to mental activities. OK, so things like thinking, paying attention, using language, that's all cognition. And if you survey people who have epilepsy, and these studies have been done many times, over and over we learn that memory is the number one cognitive complaint of people who have epilepsy. All right, so I told you I would explain what clinical neuropsychology is because it's clinical neuropsychologists who tend to evaluate these kinds of problems. So there are lots of different kinds of conditions that affect brain functioning. And the job of the neuropsychologist is to use science to evaluate the impact that brain functioning has on cognition and on behavior. Um, it's a specialty area within clinical psychology, so neuropsychologists are trained as psychologists and then have extra specialty <coughs> training in the area of um, clinical psychology. So we all said we had memory problems, right? Including me. So it's a little bit like, um, you know, if any of you listen to Garrison Keillor and you know Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong and all the men are good looking and all the children are above average. And so the joke in that is we can't all be above average. And we also probably aren't all memory impaired. And so even though we feel like we have memory failures, part of the challenge in clinical neuropsychology is to figure out whether you're actually below average given how old you are, given how much education you have, given some other individual differences. And so we use research to try to determine um, where you fall in terms of being average or above average or below average, okay? We all sort of expect ourselves to have perfect memory, and then when we don't, we worry, but, but actually lots of people have memory failures. Okay. so. Um, if you have epilepsy, you've had a bunch of different tests. And I just want to take a moment to say what's different about the neuropsychological evaluation and what it tells us about the brain. So um, EEG looks at the electrical activity in the brain. And then many people in the room have had MRIs or CT scans. And that tells us about brain structure. Um, we have had a PET and look at brain activity. But so far, none of this tells us how your brain is actually working when you go to do something like try to remember or pay attention. And that's our role. So neuropsychology evaluates the cognitive functioning piece. And sometimes it goes along with what we expect from the other tests, but sometimes it doesn't. All right. So um, I keep moving this because I'm hearing an echo. Is the sound OK? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, OK. So um, cognitive abilities are partially hierarchical in nature. And I will explain what I mean by that. 
This is part of why we do the number of tests that we do. So if I filled this room with neuropsychologists, they would all fight with each other about this picture. So don't take the picture too literally, but it's just meant to be an example. So down at the bottom, you see learning and memory, which is what we're talking about, right? Memory skills. And what this is meant to show is that that comes as a late stage of lots of different cognitive processes that have to be in place. And if any of the things above it are impaired, you're going to have trouble on tasks that involve memory. And that doesn't mean memory is your primary problem. So part of why we test a lot of different things is that we're trying to make the correct diagnosis of where the problem lies so that we can give a treatment that's appropriate to the problem, OK? So let's start at the top. Um, here's, uh, here's where attention comes into play. And sometimes we don't pay attention because we don't feel like it or we're not interested. And sometimes we don't pay attention for neurologic reasons. Your brain can have trouble, especially um, with some epilepsy syndromes, with um, paying attention to things. So I'll tell you a situation we've all been in. You go into a group setting. There are a lot of people there. Someone introduces themselves. Three seconds later, you have no idea the name of the person next to you. Have we all had that experience? OK. <laughs> So that is not because your memory is bad. It's because you weren't paying attention, OK? And if you were really paying attention, you would probably be able to remember it three seconds later, OK? So some people have difficulty at this attentional level, and it makes them feel like they have a memory problem. Make sense? OK. Now the next thing is that when information comes in, we have to be able to process it accurately. And so for verbal information like me talking to you right now, you have to have some language skills. You have to be able to understand what I'm saying, and that's a problem for some people. Sometimes you have to be able to express yourself with language, OK? If it's visual information, you have to be able to perceive that correctly, and that's the visual spatial functioning part. And I'm not talking about whether your vision's good and whether you need glasses. I'm talking about how your brain interprets and processes visual information, OK? So those have to be in place, too, or we're going to have memory problems. The next part almost no one's heard of, which is working memory. And here's what working memory is. It's your ability to take in information and hold it in mind for the very short term and manipulate it. So some of you have had doctors ask you to do things like spell the word world backwards. That's a working memory task. You have to picture it. You have to hold it in mind, and you have to manipulate it to make your response. There's lots of things in life that are working memory tasks, OK? Um, and if you have difficulty with working memory, you're going to have trouble with your learning. This is an area that's um, very big in research right now. We're doing some studies in our laboratory, and we don't perfectly understand the relationship between working memory and longer-term memory. And it's an evolving area. We've been, we've been doing studies, and we see these difficulties in lots of people with epilepsy have working memory problems, lots of people. OK, then finally, we're where we're started, which is learning and memory. So you can see that there are a lot of different things if I think I have a memory problem, in quotes, it might be attention, language, visual-spatial functioning, working memory, learning and memory, and then there's some other choices that I am not going to bother you with today. For example, the better you are at organizing the information you're trying to learn, the better you're going to do with it, OK? So part of what we're trying to do is tease apart what the core deficits are that are contributing to the difficulties that people are having so that we can tailor interventions to the to that area. But no matter which of these you're impaired in, you're probably going to experience yourself as having memory problems because they all interfere with performance on memory tasks. All right. So the next point is that I keep saying memory. But there's actually lots of different kinds of memory, and people have difficulty with one kind or another kind, depending on what's going on in the brain. So here are some of the components. One is learning new things. So most things in life come at us one time, and you either get it or you don't get it. You either got my last slide already, or it's gone now, because I'm not going to go back to that slide, OK? 
Then there's other things that we have multiple chances to learn, like if you're reading a textbook and studying for an exam, you could go back over things. And so some people have a lot of trouble if things are only presented once, but they can do okay if it comes over multiple trials. So one thing we assess is how new learning goes. Separate from that, some people can learn things, but then they forget them when there's a delay. It's like they never learned it. Okay, that's a different process, involves a different part of the brain, and we look at that too. Most people who have memory problems have more difficulty with recent information than long ago information. Um, especially in epilepsy, and especially in um, epilepsy that's on one side of the brain, there may be memory problems that only affect verbal information or only affect spatial information. And we would, of course, have different recommendations depending on that. Um, most people with epilepsy have difficulty remembering factual kind of information, but not procedures like how to ride a bike. Okay, and I'm going to come back to that point in a little bit. Um, the other thing is that some different situations have different information requirements. Okay, so if I were going to ask you to take a test and write down the answer to a question, that's really different than if I give it in a multiple choice format and you get to recognize it and say, oh yeah, I remember that one's the right answer. Okay, so sometimes we see difficulties come out in different situations and it's important we assess across all of those. All righty. So there are a lot of conditions that cause people with epilepsy to experience problems on memory kinds of tasks. One is that it's extremely common for people who have epilepsy to often have some degree of depression or anxiety, a very high percentage of people. And those kinds of conditions actually affect memory. I'm going to talk about that just a little more in a minute. So you see there are some things that are actually not the epilepsy itself that can cause some of these problems. Ongoing seizure activity affects memory. Medications affect memory. I'm sure a lot of people have had that experience in this room. But often what they're affecting is the attentional or the working memory part rather than the memory formation itself. And then lastly, some people have epilepsy that's caused by damage to the same brain regions that form new memories. And that applies most specifically to temporal lobe epilepsy. There are some other kinds that could be affected. And um, I just wanted to take a moment to, to show you what happens in cognition with depression, just as an example. Because I said there are other things like anxiety and medications, but just one example of something that's really not the epilepsy itself that can affect your memory performance. So um, depression interferes with attention. It slows down learning, although it doesn't cause people to forget usually. It makes it harder to do effortful tasks. And usually people experience memory tasks as effortful kinds of tasks. And it also makes people slower in their responding. And remember how we said things go by pretty quickly and they usually go by only once. And if you didn't get it, you're not going to remember it. Okay. So the reason I have this slide here is just to remind you that there are some other conditions besides epilepsy that contribute to the problems that many people are experiencing. Okay, so let me talk about some things that every person in the room could do if you want to help your memory, since we all apparently have impaired in memory. So some are health behaviors. Um, and I'll tell you that in this, the broad summary is that if something's good for your heart, it's good for your brain. And I actually don't mean it as a joke. I'm glad you're amused. But, um, <laughs> but um, things that improve cardiovascular health improve brain health, too, and improve cognition. And there's a ton of research on this. We've been doing a lot of it um, in our lab, too. Exercise is associated with better cognitive performance, including in people with epilepsy. We have some data on this that we're working on. So exercise improves attention, improves memory, 
It reduces stress, and Dr. Privatera talked to you about the relationship between stress and epilepsy. It reduces age-associated cognitive changes, which is a fancy way to say as we get older, we don't remember things as well, and this can help mitigate some of that. And there's even some evidence in the dementia literature that regular exercise can help reduce your likelihood of developing something like Alzheimer's disease down the line. Okay. Now, I'm not talking about running marathons. I'm talking about just not being sedentary, walking more, um, not sitting all the time. And the data show that people who have epilepsy are actually much more sedentary than people in the general population. Okay. Now, the cool thing about exercise, it's, it's a non-medicinal way that you can improve a lot of aspects of your functioning and that everyone can do. Okay. I should say with the rare exception of the small number of people who have exercise-induced seizures, which is not the majority of people. Okay, here's another health-related thing. Nutrition, hydration, drinking enough water, and controlling your weight are all associated in lots and lots of studies with better cognitive functioning. See, I have my water, I'm advertising, okay. All right, so again, improvement in attention and memory, improvement in problem solving and reasoning, and that goes mostly with the weight part. So if you just take someone's BMI and look at it against their cognitive function, you can see a real straight line where the heavier you are, the more difficulty you have with problem solving and reasoning. Okay, has nothing to do with your epilepsy. Okay, you already heard a little bit about how it's not very helpful to drink alcohol and use other drugs, so I'm going to be real quick on this. But um, we know that um, there's lots of cognitive research to suggest that alcohol especially is a particularly bad drug for your brain. Alcohol directly kills nerve cells. If you take out neurons and put them in culture and put alcohol on it, they die. It's a toxin to nerve cells. And so um, we know that people who drink have poor cognitive functioning. Now the good news is that if you stop, your, that, that decrement tends to improve. The older we get, the more permanent the changes seem to be, and once we get to around 40, it's really a good idea to cut way back on the alcohol or stop because your body just does not respond to it well, okay? And same with other drugs of abuse. And I just want to make one other point, um, I don't see too many, adolescents in the audience, but, but your brain develops, is continuing to develop until you're at least in your mid-20s, it's actually, it, especially the frontal lobes of the brain are still developing. And they're starting to be a very interesting and very um, consistent looking literature, um, especially in marijuana and alcohol, that use during those ages rewires the brain in a way that's permanent and not helpful and can cause attentional and memory problems that are, that are lifelong. Okay, and then Dr. Privatera already talked about how you're gonna have more seizures if you're drinking alcohol. Okay, then the other one I wanted to talk about is cigarette smoking, and this is another area that we've done some research in here. Um, so if you smoke, you probably know that at the moment you're smoking, during the acute drug effects, you may feel better attention and more focused, okay? But then we have to look at the lifetime effects of smoking and taking in all these carcinogens and all the smoke and all the other debris that comes from smoking. And you can put smoking marijuana right in the same category, okay? And what's very clear is that the longer and the more people smoke, and we can actually create a number of like how many, um, how much, cigarette consumption there's been across the whole lifetime, it's very closely tied to how poor memory is and how poor attention and some other skills are, okay? Now that's partially reversible with quitting. And we've done that research too in people with epilepsy because we had the question, well, if you already have problems with your brain from epilepsy, is smoking going to even make it worse? And the answer is yes. Yes, it still is worse in people who have epilepsy. Okay, so everything we've talked about so far, these are all things that have nothing to do with, with your epilepsy, that you have complete control over, um, and that you can change to have better cognitive functioning. 
And the interesting thing in the smoking literature is that um, some papers report, and this is our experience, that people with epilepsy smoke at about three times the rate of the general population. Okay, and again, this is, we all know it's unhealthy, it's also bad for your brain and bad for your cognition. All right, and just very quickly, because I want to stay on time here, but um, I gave you some data about depression, and we could say the same about anxiety. And we have really effective treatments for these kind of mental health problems, and they don't have to be medicine. So the data show that some of the newer, very targeted psychotherapies meet or exceed the effects of medication for these kinds of problems. Okay? Um, and if you think of psychotherapy as sitting down and talking about your toilet training, that is not what I'm talking about. Okay? So there are some empirically validated treatments that um, focus on your depression and teach you good skills. So medicine only works when it's in your body, right? But psychotherapy can teach you skills that you can use all the time. So I just want to advocate for that a little bit. And then, of course, you want to be working with your doctor to minimize your seizures so that um, that doesn't affect cognition as much. All right, so let me just turn quickly here to, these are some cognitive things that you can do. And again, it would apply to everyone in the room, including me, but I already said I have memory problems. Okay. One is arranging your environment to minimize distractions. So for example, if you're working on the computer, you're going to do a much better job if there's nothing on the screen except what you're trying to work on. Everything else is a distraction. If your email's popping up and telling you you got a new message, it's a distraction and it reduces productivity. And same with just sort of being in a messy environment reduces productivity. Get organized, okay? So we know that learning material is easier if you do it in an organized way and our memory is better for organized material. Okay, and so if you have a big mess and you're sort of trying to remember one little unrelated fact at a time, you're not going to do as well as if you organize the task and have a systematic way of going through it. Okay, everyone should be doing one thing at a time. We have a myth that's called multitasking. Our brain does not multitask. Our brain does one thing at a time. If you're trying to do more than one thing at a time, there's lots of data behind this, by the way. If you're trying to do more than one thing at a time, what you're actually doing is stopping both tasks and alternating between them and making yourself very, very inefficient, okay? Now, the other thing is when you are switching between tasks, you're relying very heavily on attention and working memory. Working memory is what's allowing you to say, here's the point I'm at on task A that I have to come back to after I do this part of task B, okay? So it's bad for everyone to multitask, but if you're a person who, because of epilepsy or other reasons, has reduced attention and working memory, you just put this huge burden on exactly the areas that are impaired. Okay? So you're going to be especially vulnerable to having these problems. So one thing at a time. Do one task, put it aside, do the next task. You'll be much, much more efficient. Okay? And I want to mention one other thing about that. I have no data on this, absolutely none. It's just my personal clinical experience. <clears throat> Is that when I see people who have a, um, serious working memory problems, they tend to be irritated when people interrupt them at home. And it causes a lot of stress at home. So like someone will be working, and then the next person will come in the room and try to start talking to them. And then you get yelled at, right? And, you know, so this is resonating for some people. Um, that's because if you have reduced working memory, you're working so hard just to stay on what you're doing. And then as you enter the room as the second person, you're creating multitasking. Okay, and so my recommendation is to just have some good communication around that. Hey honey, you know that I'm having some trouble with my working memory. If you could just wait a few minutes, then you'll have my full attention. Just get permission for that ahead of time. It smooths a lot of things out. So that's my marital and relationship advice for the day. Okay, then <laughs> the other thing is that everyone, and I mean everyone, whether or not you have epilepsy, should have a memory notebook. And you should put all your notes in one place. 
If I had a nickel for every time someone explains to me that they have a hundred post-its <laughs> all over their house. So not only is that disorganized, but you have to remember where the post-its are, right? And you're having memory problems already. Why do you want to do that to yourself? <laughs> And if you have spatial memory problems, you have to remember the visual location of the post-it. Whereas if you have one notebook, you always know where the stuff is. You might have to flip a couple pages, but that notebook should go with you to the doctor. It should come with you today, okay? You should always be writing in the same place. If you wind up putting something in a post-it, go and tape it into your notebook later when you're done so that everything's in one place and it's organized, okay? All my students and I, we have our memory notebooks, okay. One notebook, by the way. I said plural, but you really want one. This is the last point, um, and that is that, um, so I'm going to give you an example. Even the people in this room who have the most severe memory problems, you probably never forget to brush your teeth before bed. Because you're not using your memory, it's a habit. And you've built up that habit over lots of years, and you wouldn't dream of going to bed without brushing your teeth. Now, the part of your brain that controls habits is separate from the parts of your brain that control your attention and your memory and your working memory. Okay, so every person in here can use habits to improve their performance. So I'm going to give you an example. Suppose I lose my keys all the time. Okay, and, I, and it's so frustrating and stressful, and I'm always searching everywhere for my keys. Well, what I want you to do is I want you to find one place in your house where those keys go no matter what. And for one month, I want you to put them there every single time you put them down. No leaving them in the living room or the kitchen or the bathroom or wherever the heck you are, and then going and searching the entire house and having the whole family look for your keys, okay? You put them in the exact same place, and it becomes a habit, okay? And then again, to make the same point I made earlier, now I'm not relying on my memory skills, and I'm not relying on my attention or my working memory skills. The keys are always there. I don't have to think about where they are. There's lots of different habits that we can put together. We can always bring the mail in and put it in one place instead of bills scattered through the whole house. Okay? We can have routines about looking at our to-do list every single morning, first thing no matter what. And all those habits are controlled by completely different parts of your brain and there's no, you won't have any trouble with that because of your other memory problems. Okay, that's all I have for you for today. <laughs>